Hello, I'm Joaquin van Schoren. Welcome to lecture six in our machine learning course. And today we'll talk about data pre-processing or how we can handle real world data and feed it to our machine learning algorithms. Uh, well, first of all, machine learning algorithms, they make a lot of assumptions about the data. They will, for instance, assume that the data is normally distributed, that the features are on the same scale, that there are purely numeric features or contrary only categorical features. And in reality, the data may look quite different. There may be all kinds of problems. There may be all kinds of problems with the way that the data was collected or just the way the data is. And then in those cases, these assumptions are violated. Now we can either select algorithms based on how well they can deal with that. For instance, decision trees or random forest and so on, everything that's tree-based can handle categorical features quite easily, can handle different scale data without any issue. But many of the other algorithms that we saw, like support vector machines and later neural networks, they do assume, for instance, that the data is scaled. So if we want to use our model on this raw data, we need to pre-process it first. And for that, we build a pipeline. A pipeline is a series of steps uh, which we take to transform the data from an initial raw form into a clean form, or at least a clean enough form that we can then feed to our learning algorithms. And there's a host of different techniques that we can use. First of all, there's scaling. In scaling, we take a feature which is, for instance, scaled from minus infinity to plus infinity, and we scale it to a, a range that we want, for instance, zero, one. And more importantly, we want all the features to be on the same scale for various reasons, which we will discuss in a minute. Uh, we can also encode the data, which means that we transform categorical features into numeric features. For instance, if we have a list of countries like the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, uh, and we want to give it to an SVM, it can't deal with that. So we need to, first of all, transform that categorical feature into one or more numeric features that we can then feed to our SVM algorithm. Sometimes we have many features and not all of them are very important. And some algorithms can deal with that well, like trees, or cannot deal with that well. And we may want to select the features beforehand. Also, typically also to just make models smaller and faster to predict. The contrary of that is feature engineering. So here we add new features based on the existing ones, particularly to help simple models like linear models. And then often we'll see that our data has missing values and we'll have to deal with that. Otherwise we can't do stuff like compute distances. And sometimes the data is imbalanced. We may have a lot of data from one class, but very few for another class. And we need to deal with that well as well. And then there are a whole range of techniques which will take high dimensional data and make it lower dimensional. PCA is, for instance, a very well-known example of this. Uh, we won't go into too much detail in this area, uh, but it's definitely something you can do whenever you want to transform your data. And then finally, some, kind, some kinds of data, like text, uh, they're not easy to represent with features. Uh, and the best known techniques today are to learn embeddings. So embeddings is similar to this approach, but embedding is some numerical representation of uh, some typically non-structured data so that we can learn from it. We Again, we won't touch about upon this in this lecture, but we'll come back to this later when we talk about deep learning. Okay, so whenever we have uh, selected our cleaning steps, uh, we need to find the best combination of these transformations and learning methods. Often we, we do this empirically. We do use cross-validation to basically tune our pipelines to our data. Sometimes we have to tune high parameters of our learning algorithms. We have to choose between different preprocessors. And sometimes these preprocessors also have their own high parameters that we need to tune. And very importantly, we will have to make sure that there's no data leakage going on. When we transform this data, we must always make sure that no data leaks from the test data into our training data. And that's, that will happen very easily, and we will see ways to avoid that. 
In the first video, now we'll touch upon uh, scaling and encoding, and we'll talk about how to uh, do cross validation over these pipelines. So first, scaling. Right. So we do scaling whenever we have data which is in different scales. For instance, in this case, we have some data here. This is basically the iris data set, a little bit moved. And we see that in this feature, the values are between uh, 2 and 4, and here they are a bit larger. It's not extreme, but we, we still want to, just for illustration purposes, bring these to the same scale. And there exist a number of different ways to do that. One way uh, is, for instance, to use a standard scaling technique. Uh, we'll, we'll go into much more detail uh, in a few slides about how this works. Uh, basically, we will transform this around zero and weight uh, unit variants here. Another technique is robust scaling, which works with quantiles. There is min-max scaling, where we scale between zero and one. There is normalization. We'll talk a lot more about that later. And max after scalar is similar to min-max, but uh, again, it, it maintains zeros. So we'll, we'll look into how all these different techniques work. Now first, let's illustrate why we need scaling. Now scaling is very important for any algorithm that computes some kind of distances. Say for instance, KNN. KNN, of course, computes distances, right? So we want to, for instance, compute the distance between this point here and all the other points. Uh, distance, say that we have distance between a point A and a point B. And say we use Euclidean distance, then we compute the distance between any feature, so say you have x1 and x2 here, then we compute uh, the value of a according to feature 1 minus b feature 1 squared plus a2 plus, sorry, minus b2 squared. Right? Uh, so this could be point a, this could be a point b here. Right? Now, if this feature here is nicely scaled between 0 and 6, but this feature here is scaled between 0 and 12,000, then we can see that uh, the term that looks at x1, this one, will have a much bigger influence than this one. It will, it will basically drown out any difference we have here. Right? So you may as well forget about this one, because this one will dominate uh, the, the sum of the distances here. That means that if you would train a classifier like Hainan and it wants to compute the nearest neighbors, it basically is only looking at this feature here. Like this point will be similar, this one will be similar, this point will be similar, but this point here or this point here, they will not be similar because according to this feature, they're very far away. So, if you would then use KNN, and we would, for instance, look at the nearest neighbors, it would basically only look in, in this direction here. Now, if you would plot the predictions, you would get something like this. Um, this may be a bit confusing. What is based, so, these are not verticals. These are actually very highly skewed boundaries. So, the actual boundary is something like so if you go outside of this figure, something like this, right? So it would look down like this. So it's just, it's a boundary like you see here with ups and downs. But because this feature has such a large effect, these ups and downs are magnified in this direction. Right? And yeah, this, first of all, gives us very intuitive uh, results. And second of all, if you, if you look at the accuracy, we see the accuracy is actually quite low. It's actually very low. It's 46% accuracy. While if we would simply scale the data, so here we do just a normal standardized scaling, uh, we see that now the KNN is much, will have much less extreme uh, boundaries, and the, the accuracy is also a lot larger. Right? So scaling really helps a lot here. And it is not at all limited to KNN. Uh, for instance, SVMs, remember, they compute dot products, which are also kind of distances, and whether you kernelize them or not, uh, it's some kind of distance, right? So uh, this 
only works well if the data is um, scaled. If I replace this scan in here with a support vector machine, we see that, well, we can't even see the boundary. It's somewhere outside of the figure. It may even be far away. And the accuracy is quite low. Well, if we scale it, our SVM nicely learns uh, the model here and gets also a much larger performance, 92%. Linear SVM will be mostly the same. The model here is linear. But again, we can see that if we don't scale the data, it doesn't learn a good model at all. If you look at the logistic regression, well, here it has less problems. The logistic regression is quite robust against scaling, but it, well, it's robust against scaled data, uh, but it would still affect the regularization. And in this case, we use C equals 10. We see the accuracy on the unscaled data is 85. Uh, if you scale it, it's a little bit higher, 92. You can also use your original data uh, and then tune C to get a higher performance. It's also possible. Um, but you will also see that if you look at the weights, they will be quite different here. So you do classification here. So uh, you want to predict whether Y is larger or smaller than zero. Uh, and the weight you would find for this feature here will be much, much larger than you will find in this feature here, most likely. I haven't looked at it, but most likely those weights will be at the very different scales. Right? And it also makes it harder to, pre to understand, right? So this feature will have a much smaller weight just because it has larger values, right? We can't really interpret what that means in terms of its importance in the predictions. Right? So yeah, we can't really interpret this, this, these weights if we don't scale the data. Also, regularization is much harder. Um, yeah, here you may want to actually look at the test points to see the difference. Like, because the, if you look only at the training points, uh, it seems they make the same mistakes, but these are training points. If you add test points, uh, you can see that uh, actually this model misses this test point. And this model is more regularized, and it actually contributes this model, which is why it has a higher accuracy. Right. So scaling is, is very important for any algorithm which uses distances, and other algorithms are also helped by it. Now, there's different ways to do that. Uh, the most common way is called standard scaling. What standard scaling does is, quite simply, uh, it takes the data, and in every dimension, it computes the mean and the standard deviation. Sigma, right? So there's some value here. And then it will do the same in, in this direction. It will also compute the mean and standard deviation in this direction. Right? And when, it, when it's done that, it basically subtracts the mean. So say the mean in this direction was here, the mean in this direction was here. You subtract the mean from all other points. You bring it down to here and then down to here. And then so we subtract the mean from the data, and then we divide by, we scale by the standard deviation that we observed, which means that after we do that, the mean will be zero in every feature, so it is feature-wise. And the standard deviation will be one, so something like this. And the standard deviation would be one, right? So standard scaling is probably one of the most useful techniques. It sort of assumes that your data is more or less distributed. It doesn't have to be completely Gaussian, but it assumes that it's close to Gaussian. But if your data is very non-Gaussian, it doesn't work that well, and we'll see different ways of doing that, of handling that kind of data. Min-max scaling is also very common. Uh, so here we simply scale the data between 0 and 1, or we can also choose between any min and max value. The way we do that is by looking at each feature again separately, and we compute x min. That's the minimum value. We compute x max. That's the maximum value. We subtract x min, which will be 0, 
and then we scale by the difference between uh, x min, x max, and this will bring the data between 0 and 1. And we do the same in the other direction, and then our data is nicely scaled between 0 and 1 in all features. If you don't want 0 and 1, if you want, for instance, minus 1 and 1 or something else, we have to scale it with the boundary conditions that we want, and it would do that. Right? So, for instance, if we set uh, min to minus 1 and max to 1, it would basically scale this data between minus 1 and 1. Yeah, uh, this usually makes sense if you have data where the minimum and maximum values actually mean something. Like an age has typically a minimum and maximum value, more or less, um, like the age of a person. Uh, if the feature does not have a meaningfully, well, does not have a minimum, meaningful minimum maximum, it's probably a bit less useful or less enjoyable at least. It's also sensitive to outliers. So say that you have one point here, then x min in this direction will be zero, and the data won't move at all in this direction. Right? So it's very sensitive to outliers. The, the, the previous method, like standard scaling, if well, if you would have an outlier, it, it would still affect the mean, but a bit less so. It, it, it still affected, but, but not that much. If we do still want to uh, be robust against this, we can use something called robust scaling. Robust scaling is similar to standard scaling, with the important dis difference that we do not use the mean and the standard deviation, because those are more easily influenced by outliers. But instead of the mean, we compute the median. The median is a point in the middle, so that half the points are to the left, half points to the right. Half points to the left, half points to the right. And we compute the, the upper and lower quantiles, which means the quantile is probably somewhere here. This could be Q25, which means that only 25 other points are to the right here. And Q75 would mean that, yeah, it's 75% of the features are smaller and the remaining 25 are to the right. What this means is that um, these quantiles are not affected by outliers. If there is a point here or a point there or somewhere far away, it would typically not affect the quantile. It, a little bit, of course, but not so much, as long as the other points are uh, nicely close to each other. And what it then does is similar to min to min max. Well, similar to standard scaling, uh, but it would then scale the data so that uh, you transform it by the median. You, you, you subtract the median, and you make sure that uh, the quantiles then end up at minus one, and the upper one at one. Right. So after you scale that, where you would have the Q25 will now be minus one, and the Q75, the 75 quantile, uh, will end up at one. And that again for each feature. Okay, uh, then you have normalization. So normalization is typically only used whenever you have very high dimensional data uh, and typically count data. Say for instance, you have um, a, a, a set of documents and you represent those documents by the words that are in the document. Right? So say the fox, blah, blah, jumps, whatever. Right? So every word is a column, and we have document one. And document one has the word the five times, and the word fox two times, and blah, blah. And document two has the word the 10 times, and the word fox one time, and so on, right? So uh, we compute these counts for all the features, for uh, every word in every document. What normalization does, it transforms these features so that the sum of all the features x in every row equals one, at least for the L1 norm. Right? So we'll probably scale the five to something like uh, 0 0.8, and maybe this becomes 0 0.2. Right? So we scale it so that the sum of these values equals one, and so on. Um, 
So that's useful whenever uh, you had kind of count data. It's also very useful whenever you have high dimensional data and you want to compute some kind of uh, distance, like Euclidean distance. Now, we've seen before that computing the Euclidean distance in high dimensions kind of loses its meaning. Right? If you have 100 dimensions, then basically on average, the Euclidean distances all become the same between every two points. So that's not useful. Um, what you can do in high dimensions is use a cosine similarity. Now, the cosine similarity is not so easy to compute. Right? It's a bit expensive. Uh, but uh, cosine similarity is equivalent to the Euclidean distance if your data is normalized. So normalized, uh, L2 normalized, means that, uh, again, you have your features, you have high-dimensional features, and you make sure that the sum of their values squared equals 1. Right? Um, and if you do that, then uh, you can compute meaningful distances in high dimensions. So even if you have like 10,000 features here, uh, you can still use uh, normal Euclidean distances if it is normalized. And that's very handy. This is basically the idea behind a lot of this, like the, the, the vector representation models that you use for, uh, for text classification and so on. So there again, every document is a high dimensional vector, uh, for instance, with TF-IDF data um, for every word. And then uh, you do want to normalize your data so that you can uh, easily compute distances. So you can use kernelized methods, just such, such as SVMs and so on. Um, so if you use the L1 norm, it basically means that you project your data onto this little environment here, the unit environment. If you use L2, it's equivalent to projecting the data onto the unit circle. So the data points will end up somewhere here. So normalization is super useful whenever you have high dimensional data and uh, you want to do something like compute distances with it. And then there is a maximum absolute scalar. So this is, um, I think, only really useful whenever you have sparse data. So say you are, uh, you want to build a recommender system for movies and you have this huge table and you have, I don't know, a million movies um, and you have maybe a million uh, users and these users they for instance give you ratings for some of the movies that of course they haven't seen most movies so this data is very sparse only some values are non-zero and all the rest are zero now if you have this kind of data you want to store it in a sparse format which means you don't store the entire matrix you would basically only store a tuple like user 5 movie 12 and rating I don't know, 8. Whatever, right? So you can store these values as tuples and then you don't have to store this entire matrix. Now, the problem comes when you want to scale this data. If you would compute the mean of all these uh, ratings um, and you would then subtract the mean, then all these zeros would become non zero. And that's bad because then you, the data is not sparse anymore, you cannot store it efficiently, your memory will blow up and your algorithm will crash. So <laughs> that's not good. So uh, to avoid that, what you can do is um, maximum effort scaler. And what that does is basically, it's a scaling so that the all the values which are zero are not moved. Right? So it's it still scales, but in such a way that the zeros remain zero, so that this will still be scaled in this direction and this direction. Um, you can see it scales, in this case, to uh, zero, 1. But every point that was zero will still be zero after you scale the data. So this, this conserves sparseness. Uh, and yeah, that's what we want whenever we have sparse data. And then finally, what if your data is not known or distributed at all? For instance, if you look at the number of Twitter followers that a person has, there are a lot of persons which have maybe 10, 20 Twitter followers. And 
a larger number which have 100 or 200. And yet very, very few people will, will should have like several million followers. This is what, is what we call like in log normal distribution. Um, it's similar to the Poisson distribution. Um, so log normal means that after, so if this is x, and we would compute the log of x, that the data becomes nicely normally Gaussian distributed. Right. So yeah, that's the idea. So if we know that the data is log normal, we'll just take the log of that data, of that feature, and then we end up with a new feature which is nicely normally distributed. But in many cases, we don't really know what the distribution of our data is, right? It could be log normal, or it could be more like chi squared, or maybe something else. Luckily, we have a nice transformation, which is called the box Cox transformation, which can transform most distributions to a nice normal distribution. It has this shape here. Uh, it has a parameter lambda. If lambda is zero, it just does the log x transform. If uh, lambda is different, then it uses this formulation. So it takes your data x, it raises it to the lambda degree, minus one, and it's scaled by lambda. The beauty, the beauty of this is that lambda, you don't have to choose, you can learn it, you can fit it on your training data. Right? So that gives you a very nice practical solution. You just give your features and you let the transformation itself figure out how to transform it so that it becomes more normal. Uh, we use the box cost transformation whenever the data is positive, right? so you can't have negative values. If you do have negative values, you can use the Geo Johnson transformation. All right, thank you.